So I said, well, could the speed of light have actually dropped? And that would have amazing implications if so. He said, no, no, of course it couldn't have actually dropped. It's a constant. So, oh, uh, well then how do you explain the fact everyone was finding it going much slower during that period? Is it because they were fudging their results to get what they thought other people should be getting and the whole thing was just produced by, in the minds of physicists? Um, he said, we don't like to use the word fudge. I said, well, what do you prefer? He said, well, uh, we prefer to call it intellectual phase locking. Uh, <laughs> so I said, well, if it was going on then, how can we say sure it's not going on today? And that the present values are produced by intellectual phase locking. And he said, oh, we know that's not the case. I said, how do we know? He said, well, he said, we've solved the problem. And I said, well, how? He said, well, we fixed the speed of light by definition in 1972. So I said, but it might still change. He said, yes, but we'd never know it because we've defined the meter in terms of the speed of light. So the units had changed with it. So he looked very pleased about that. They'd fixed that problem. <laughs> but I said, well, then what about big G, the gravitational constant known in the trade as big G? It's written with a capital G. Newton's universal gravitational constant. That's varied by more than 1.3% in recent years. Um, and it seems to vary from place to place and from time to time. And he said, oh, well, those are just errors. And uh, unfortunately, there are quite big errors with big G. Um, so I said, well, what if it's really changing? I mean, perhaps it is really changing. And um, then I looked at how they do it. What happens is they measure it in different labs. They get different values on different days, and then they average them. And then other labs around the world do the same. And they come out usually with a rather different average. And then the International Committee on Metrology meets every 10 years or so and average the ones from labs around the world to come up with the value of big G. But what if G were actually fluctuating? What if it changed? There's already evidence, actually, that it changes throughout the day and throughout the year. What if the Earth, as it moves through the galactic environment, went through patches of dark matter or other environmental factors that could alter it? Maybe they all change together. What if these errors are going up together and down together? For more than 10 years, I've been trying to persuade metrologists to look at the raw data. In fact, I'm now trying to persuade them to put it online on the internet with the dates and the actual measurements and see if they're correlated, to see if they're all up at one time, all down at another. If so, they might be fluctuating together and that would tell us something very, very interesting. But no one has done this. They haven't done it because G's are constant. There's no point looking for changes. You see, here's a very simple example of where uh, a dogmatic assumption actually inhibits inquiry. I myself think that the constants may vary quite considerably, uh, well, within narrow limits, but they may all be varying. And I think the day will come when scientific journals like Nature have a weekly report on the constants, like stock market reports in newspapers. You know, this week, big G was slightly up, the, speed on, the charge on the electron was down, the speed of light held steady, and so on. Uh, um, so... Um, that's one area, just one, of the, one area where I think uh, thinking less dogmatically could open things up. One of the biggest areas is the nature of the mind. This is the most unsolved problem, as Graham just said, uh, that science simply can't deal with the fact we're conscious. Um, and it can't deal with the fact that our thoughts don't seem to be inside our brains. Um, our, our, our experiences don't all seem to be inside our brain. Your image of me now uh, doesn't seem to be inside your brain, yet the official view is there's a little Rupert somewhere inside your head, and everything else in this room is inside your head. Your experience is inside your brain. I'm suggesting, actually, that vision involves an outward projection of images. What you're seeing is in your mind, but not inside your head. Our minds are extended beyond our brains in the simplest act of perception. I think that we project out the images we're seeing, and these images... Uh, touch what we're looking at. If I look at you from behind, you don't know I'm there, could I affect you? Could you feel my gaze? 
There's a great deal of evidence that people can. The sense of being stared at is an extremely common experience, and recent uh, experimental research uh, suggests it's real. Animals seem to have it too. I think it probably evolved in the context of predator-prey relationships. Prey animals that could feel the gaze of a predator would survive better than those that couldn't. This would lead to a whole new way of thinking about ecological relationships between predators and prey, also about the extent of our minds. If we look at distant stars, I think our minds reach out in a sense to touch those stars and literally extend out over astronomical different distances. They're not just inside our heads. Now, it may seem astonishing that this is a topic of debate in the 21st century. We know so little about our own minds that where our images are is a hot topic of debate within consciousness studies right now. I don't have time to deal with any more of these dogmas, but every single one of them is questionable. If one questions it, new forms of research, new possibilities open up. And I think as we question these uh, dogmas that have held back science so long, um, science will undergo a reflowering, a renaissance. I'm a total believer in the importance of science. I've spent my whole life as a research scientist, my whole career. Um, but I think by moving beyond these dogmas, it can be regenerated once again and become interesting and, I hope, life-affirming. Thank you. My TED talk started with some girls, some charming girls in London asking me to do it at their TEDx event. They were 22-year-old students. And at first I said no, because I said I didn't like the TED business model where they pay their speakers nothing and make tens of millions a year out of conference revenues. And she said, oh no, they weren't charging lots of money and that wasn't like that. And then. Um, at first I said no, then it turned out that these girls were friends of my son, Cosmo, and he then asked me and said he was going to perform at their event and they really wanted me to do it and would I do it. So under pressure from my own son, I agreed to do it. And their event was called Challenging Existing Paradigms, so that made sense. And um, they were charming and delightful to work with and the event was a great success and the crowd there were friendly and interesting. It sold out weeks beforehand. And then they put up the, the talk on the TEDx site following all the standard procedures. And all went well for about two months until it came to the attention of Jerry Coyne, who then uh, wrote a blog denouncing TED um, for providing a platform for my talk and uh, attacking me. So something that had just gone on in a perfectly normal, calm way in the normal TED format uh, and my talk had had about 35,000 views on the TEDx website, uh, suddenly resulted in this tremendous controversy. Now, I didn't know anything about the controversy. I was traveling in a remote part of India with my wife when this burst, and you know, I didn't get emails. And when I did, I got started getting emails about what's going on and this controversy. They might take your talk down. They opened a discussion forum on whether to take my talk down. 10 to 1, the people on the forum said, no, don't take it down. So they took it down anyway. And then um, banned or took down the talk by Graham Hancock. And put them in the special naughty corner of the internet uh, with a kind of health warning by their science board saying it was pseudoscience. So um, they then published a statement from the science board saying why they thought it was pseudoscience. And the, the, state, the statement was so ludicrously wrong. You know, it said that um, my remarks on the speed of light had all been refuted and it didn't drop by 20 kilometers per second between 1928 and 1945. And it was very easy to show that in fact it did. And um, you know, the figures they quoted simply left out those dates um, it was very easy to refute every one of their points, which I did. So they then struck out the science board statement, published my um, 
refutation. And we tried to move the debate on to another blog. They kept moving blogs to try and shake off this very hostile discussion thread. Altogether, the, the taking down of my talk um, uh, resulted in more than 5,000 comments on TED discussion threads, more than any other TED talk in history. And after they took it down and pushed it in the naughty corner, it, it went up on a whole range of, of uh, kind of um, pirate websites, uh, as well as their official naughty corner. Uh, and on, it's on at least 12 of other sites now. And I just looked at two or three of them the other day, and the total views on those came to more than 200,000. So when you add in the ones on Ted's own site and all the other pirate sites, it must be getting on for over half a million by now. So the number of views has gone up enormously since they um, tried to um, ban the talk. When they first banned it, it was going very badly for Ted. Their reputation was in shreds, and lots of their fans were deeply disillusioned. Um, and I think it created a kind of existential crisis. Um, and Chris Anderson, the head of it, emailed me and asked if he could speak to me. So he rang me up, and we had a, a long conversation, um, you know, nearly an hour. Um, and... I, I got on quite well with him. Um, I think that he regretted rushing into removing these these talks, mine and Hancock's. Um, but he was also kind, of, kind of a captive of circumstance by then, and they had to justify it. I think it wasn't just Jerry Coyne, it was also P.Z. Myers, who's a, a similarly an atheist, um, a militant atheist blogger. Um, I think what's the reason that these this small group of militant atheists and dogmatic skeptics punch so far above their weight is that they claim to speak with the authority of science. They claim to speak for the scientific community, and they speak in the name of science. Now, that gives them a huge authority insofar as people believe them, because science has enormous authority, and you know, everything in the modern world depends on it. So um, by claiming to speak in the name of science, they borrow the authority of science uh, to give their own opinions vastly greater weight than they ought to have. This is, of course, a standard tactic among militant atheists. Richard Dawkins is the primary example. Uh, Richard Dawkins, um, when he was a professor at Oxford, was not professor of zoology or evolution. He was professor of the public understanding of science. And he spoke as professor of the public understanding of science. And therefore, people assumed that with that authority and a chair at Oxford, um, <clears throat> he was speaking for science. And for him, science equals atheism, not just atheism, but militant atheism. Um, and a lot of the media have actually bought into that. Um, I think it's partly because many people in the media are themselves either atheists or very sympathetic to the atheist point of view. Um, so that means that they get easy platform for their views in, in the mainstream media, especially in the science, uh, among science correspondents. And the other thing is that the skeptic groups are very well organized. For years now, the, the Committee for Skeptical Inquiry, or PSYCOP, have been running the Skeptical Inquiry magazine, which has a circulation of at least 50,000. Then there's Michael Shermer's Skeptic magazine, uh, again about 50,000 I think. Then there's the British Skeptic magazine. So we've got, you know, tens of thousands, over 100,000 skeptics, um, regular paid up subscribers to Skeptic magazines, plus large numbers of people who go to Skeptic websites who use this position, this label of skeptic, to justify a kind of atheist materialist point of view and to use their skeptical stance as a way of uh, propagating this point of view militantly. Now the skeptic organizations don't just publish their own magazines, they have a very effective campaign with the press. I discovered this years ago. I once did an interview for USA Today. Uh, a simp they, did get, they had a very sympathetic reporter and they did a one-page spread about my work on dogs that know when their owners are coming home and other research on psychic pets. 
And when the um, article came out, the reporter rang me almost in tears 